Um, I'm going to uh, very briefly introduce this panel to you. And first, I'll introduce myself. My name is Karin de Jong Kanan. I'm in the Department of World Languages and Cultures. And very briefly, I will introduce this star studded panel of seven presenters named Aubrey, Sarah, Lucy, Julie, Alexander, Paul, and Lane. And they will take it from here. <laughs> Thank you. Everyone, welcome to our session, Reimagining the Online Classroom, Six Course Activities to Foster a Transformative Learning Community. This stems from our Spring 22 Learning Circle, where we studied the book by Patrick Dempsey, Creating Transformative Online Communities in Higher Education. And many of us in this learning circle had transformative learning experiences that really changed how we think about teaching in our classrooms. And so today we're going to present a little bit about what transformative learning is and then provide you with six strategies and suggested activities that you could do in your own online classrooms to foster transformative learning. Sorry while we juggle. Yeah, it's going to be interesting passing this around. Okay, the first question is, what is transformative learning? And the officer Dempsey he had some pretty cool analogies to go by. So his first example, starting off the book, he mentioned how we're hearing a lot about people believing that the earth is flat lately. And so when we hear that thought, instant thought in our minds, it's like, okay, how do they come up with this idea? It does not make sense. But when we stop to actually listen to them, we realize our own observances doesn't make sense that the worth is round. When we drive across the country, it just feels like we're going straight across horizontally, that we're not going with the curvature of the earth. We don't feel, we do not feel the earth moving ourselves. Our own personal observations would suggest that the earth is flat, but we know from science and everything that earth really is round. But when we start to listen to them, we can say, okay, it actually makes sense why they would think the way they think. And so, transformative learning. Uh, here's a quote from the author. We all have pre-existing ways of knowing. We all encounter ideas that challenge those ways of knowing. We all face the choice of whether to ignore those ideas to maintain the integrity of our existing knowledge systems or to make adjustments to how we know, perhaps even throwing off an entire way of knowing that has proven to be ineffective in its role of helping us make sense of the world. So it's being open to otherness, as the author puts it, being willing to accept uh, without judgment um, that maybe perhaps our way of thinking might not be the correct way of thinking to allow ourselves to be able to change what we might have thought previously. And one of the coolest examples he gave is Mario Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> so with Mario Brothers, he mentions how somebody who's never had experience with Mario before, trying out level one of Mario Brothers really sets them up for success. Come here, Mario's coming up against this little creature thing. And if he runs into him, what happens? He starts right back here at the, the beginning again. So the penalty's really not that big of a deal. But then he learns, hey, if I jump on it, squish it, it's gone. I don't have to worry about it anymore. If I keep going, there's this little question mark box. If I hit it, out pops another mushroom. Well, the last mushroom just attacked me. I don't know if I want to go and use this mushroom. I want to run from it, but the level is set up where the player is almost guaranteed to get hit by that mushroom. And here comes Big Mario. And with Big Mario, all of a sudden you can smash bricks. You have two chances before you end up back into the beginning of the level. And even if you go through the level and you lose all your lives, you're starting right back here. So there's really not that big of a penalty for losing in the first place. And so right in the very first level of level one, the player is shown how to play the game and it sets them up for success. And that's how our courses ought to be as well, setting them up for success. Every student, when they're trying out a different class, has to learn a new syllabus. And it shouldn't be Greek to them. It should really be able to set them up from the beginning to help them understand what is expected of them so that they can be successful in the class. And so um, these are things that we're gonna be talking about today, how to implement transformative learning. We're gonna talk about six topics Perspective taking, new roles, reflection, projection, student research, and learner centered, learner driven. And we're going to have examples for each of these. Okay? So I'm going to talk about perspective taking. Perspective taking, um, these 
author of this book actually provide an invitation to explore alternative, but he gave us two conditions. One is that should not be confused with projection, which is going to be discussed in this and presented in this presentation later. And the other one is that ideally will be a social activity. It shouldn't be happening in isolation. Because he has another concept in that book that is open to otherness, which means that it's about me thinking about what I know, but it's also about me thinking about what I know with other people. So he is big into these cell other interactions where a student need to interact in coming up with this different perspective on a subject, but he also says that this process need to be guided. You cannot leave to the student to do free range because they might fell prey to something called confirmation bias, in which they're going to only be looking for that information that reinforces their previous belief. Uh, there are three aspects of this perspective taking. Um, three concepts associated when he say, if you're gonna design an assignment, make sure that you invite to think about the premises, the process, and the product. The premises is the why. Why do I believe what I believe? The process is the how. How do I come to these conclusions? And the product is what is that I believe? So in his book, the very last chapter, he gave us some examples, but I'm gonna add to the example that he gave to my own example that I use in class. And one of these is that we can, we can have learners try to make experiments that fail instead of succeed in the national and the applied sciences. I know it might not be easy to design an experiment that might fail, but and then an alternative will look to a case study in which an experiment has failed. For example, I teach finances. And in the 1930s, the Federal Housing Administration implemented some policies supposedly to increment home ownership, but it actually what it did is promoted redlining, also known as discrimination and lending. So you can ask a student, what happened here? What were the premises? What the policy maker assume? How do they come to this conclusion that it's gonna be a successful policy? Another example, and because of time, I won't deal with the first one, is include prone and discussion that ask learning to explore topics that are familiar from their point of view or that might themselves might not agree. And I'm just gonna do a quick experiment here in one minute. So I'm gonna ask you a question, also related to finances. Raise your hand if you believe that it's better to buy a new car as opposed to a used car. So you believe that it's better to buy a new car, raise your hand. Okay, <laughs> now raise your hand that you believe it is better to buy an old car. So when I do that little test on the student, we're talking about uh, car loans, etc., and then I'll invite them to read something that go counter they believe. So if you chose to buy a new car, I'm gonna have you read the advantages of buying an old, a used car, and vice versa. And then they can talk about those uh, perspective taking. And then I finish the exercise with just a short question. Did reading a different perspective change the way that you were thinking? It stayed the same? Now you are more confused, etc. And so we'll go there. So another way, this is sort of an extension on perspective taking, is the idea of new roles. And the idea behind this is by having, an having a student take on a new role, it opens up a space for transformative thinking. Dempsey gives a few different examples of new roles that you could possibly implement in your class, and he tries to keep them as open as possible, uh, just for the flexibility of the nature of the different topics we teach, right? So for example, if you're having a group work situation, uh, maybe they're working through a problem or a scenario, you can assign people in the group to fill different roles. Maybe someone is playing the devil's advocate. Maybe someone in the group needs to function as a bridge builder. Maybe someone is a problem solver in the group. By taking on a new role, it opens a space for different thought. Another way you can apply new roles idea is with assignments. And we've, we've talked about in a few sessions about peer review in Canvas. So Canvas has options for peer review. 
But having a, a student's peer evaluate their work as if they were in the instructor, it gives a different set of eyes to the way maybe students are looking at the work that they're submitting um, from multiple perspectives. And then finally, an idea of other roles. So maybe in your field, you might be talking about policy. Maybe you have different um, problems or case studies or scenarios that your students might be examining. Imagine how different people that would be involved with this product you're creating might view the situation. So how would experts in the field look at the thing you're creating? Um, how would community stakeholders feel about this policy that you're planning on implementing? Uh, just these different perspectives you can take on. So here are a couple of examples from my own classes. One of the classes I teach is a class that's centered on um, teaching students how to teach in communities, in adult education and community settings, so non-formal education. One of the things they have to do is prepare a lesson plan and then practice teaching within the class. They do a, a short practice segment. When they upload their materials of their practice teaching, they have to let us know who we are as the target audience. So for example, perhaps we're going to be parents who are just transitioning to parenthood for the very first time. We're, perhaps we're gonna be that target audience. Will, there will be peers in the group who will be evaluating their work as if they were in that target audience. This is pretty beneficial from two perspectives. One, giving the evaluator an opportunity to learn how to evaluate work and evaluate a presentation and think about what they're presenting themselves. Um, and two, the feedback that students receive from someone who is pretending to be in that, in that target audience has been quite valuable. So students have left the experience um, anticipating questions they maybe didn't think about before, or they leave uh, with ideas of new materials they might want to include, things that they might have been missing, snags that they might run into. Another example, this is one that I use in a, in a general education class when we're learning about human development theories is giving them case studies, case scenarios. Uh, for example, this one's about a boy who's just been biting everyone he runs into, his parents, his siblings, his friends, his grandparents. He's biting everyone. Um, and so what we'll do is look at this particular case scenario and then try to examine it from different roles in this scenario. So how might a parent explain that behavior? How might a grandparent explain that behavior? And of course, we have to include some mental gymnastics. So um, how could you explain this behavior using theory as well? Would there be a difference in explaining this behavior um, depending on the perspective and role, uh, depending on which role you're taking on? Okay. The next practice is reflection. So um, whereas perspective taking was kind of looking at why we perceive, think, and feel or act as we do, reflection really focuses on you know asking yourself that and asking it when you're amongst your peers too. So a little bit more about reflection. My favorite quote from Dempsey about reflection was, it's a provisional suspension of judgment about the truth or falsity of or the belief or disbelief in ideas until a better determination can be made. So what reflection requires is an active communication with yourself and others. This can look like um, your lab group if you're in a lab setting or if you are in a Canvas discussion board or something like that, right? Another one is this openness to otherness, right? And so it's really important that you are open to admit, hey, maybe my ideas aren't really all that they seem. Maybe there is a different way of thinking out there like the flat earth or the round earth, right? So an example of an assignment that you could implement in your classroom is the mirror, microscope, and binoculars. So the mirror is self-reflection, right? The next little um, stage is the um, experience reflection. So what did an experience teach you? The next one is the binoculars, which is the big picture reflection, right? So a way you might implement this, or how I would implement it in my classroom, I am a um, biology grad student and I'm a TA for the Intro to Biology Lab. So for example, what that would look like for me is, what do, what do I currently know about this topic? An experiment that we do is we look at seed beetles mm -hmm. and how well they can lay their eggs on different types of seeds and if there are any products that prevent them from laying these eggs. So what did I learn from the pre-lab quiz? What did I learn from um, my past experience with bugs maybe? Something like that. Then you would go on to complete the exercise or chapter after maybe writing a few notes about you, what you do know, right? Okay, and then we come to, okay, what did, how did my experience with the material or the lab inform or change what I already knew? So, okay, maybe we learned that week in lab that our seed beetles really do not like neem powder covering these seeds. They don't like to lay their eggs on these seeds, right? So we can kind of combine what we already knew with what we learned, and we can analyze that, and then that, in turn, um, 
basically informs how, or how does my new knowledge impact my future studies, right? Maybe we can design an experiment that tests other types of pesticides, maybe an essential oil or something like that, right? We can create these future studies based off what we, are, what we already knew and then what we learned. And then again, it just becomes this kind of full circle of how what do what, does what I know impact my experience and then how can I implement that in the future? All right, so now we're on to projection. This is considering how I might have thought or felt about an experience. So imagine, right? After this conference, we're working on next semester's classes. You realize you have created a transformational course. Yes. Maybe you have flashbacks from this talk, just saying. Maybe you change things up. Your students are showing impressive work things are aligning, it's amazing. So how now, as you've lived through this experience, how might you feel about your work that you're gonna be putting into your courses? Or how might you go on experiencing this conference now? So this is a quick view of my activity that I have. I am a social work professor. This is going through a food assistance policy. My students have to live off of $48 a week on food allowance. They do not have to do this mandatory, but it is fun to see. Um, whoops. They then get to um, reflect on how they might view the population that they're gonna be going into working with, and also how misinformation might impact policy and how we can correct information to make progressive changes in policy. So ref projection is not reflection, because this is how I think or experience something. It is not perspective taking, because that's making a case for that perspective. This is kind of like an elaborate um, bridge of all of these things into one, which can be a more transformational tool. Okay, so another tool to help you develop sort of these transformative, transformative sort of learning experiences is student research. So when we think about the difference between scholars and students, I actually ask, I start my classes and I ask, what's the difference between a scholar and a student? And there's lots of different answers, but one of the key sort of, I think, differentiators is that students see themselves as knowledge consumers whereas scholars are knowledge creators. And so one way that we can help create these transformative learning experiences is engaging in student research where they can actually create knowledge. Um, so when you think about that, when a student changes their role or changes sort of the perspective from being a knowledge consumer to a knowledge creator, there are several different sort of psychological things that happen. First, they're more interested, right? They're gonna be more sort of engaged because obviously they get to choose the topics that they're gonna research, right? Their autonomy is sort of activated. The other thing that happens is that they're also able, because of that autonomy, they're gonna look at different perspectives and resources that otherwise they probably wouldn't consider or you might not consider. So they're more invested in the learning process and then at the end of it all, they're able to teach others, right? They can actually sort of contribute to the knowledge of the class and, and even to the, to the teacher at times. So there's three examples that I do in my own uh, sort of teaching. First is just traditional student-led research papers, um, often applying, in my context I teach leadership, so I'm having students often applying a particular leadership theory and analyzing the leadership of past leaders or leaders that they're contemporaries with. You can also you know, engage students where they partner with outside organizations and actually do research with existing companies or other organizations about particular needs that they have. And then third, they can engage in these student-led service learning projects. So in my leadership class, we have students identify a particular cause that they want to contribute to. And then they have to go through and develop sort of a way that they could contribute to that cause and sort of push it forward. Um, so yeah, and these sort of th these are three examples of different types of research. But but in all of this, I think it's important to to make that transition from student cons or from knowledge consumers to knowledge creators. And and at the end of the day, it's not necessarily what the outcome is that matters. I love this quote by Lloyd, Lloyd Alexander. He says, "In some cases, we learn more by looking for the answer to a question, 
and not finding it than we do from learning the answer itself. So in engaging in the student research, it's not necessarily about the outcome that students obtain that matters, it's about going through that research process that helps them create that transformative experience. And this leads nicely into our last strategy we're going to present to you today is to create a course that is learner-centered learner and learner-driven. So choice, personal meaning, and practical application are three ways that we can do this. And some th key principles that I wanted to highlight is that anything you can do to give your students a say in their learning is going to support transformative learning. There are simple course changes that can be made that will make a big impact in students' learning experience. And so ask yourself, where can you provide more student choice within your course this next semester? I teach an online course for all students in the education program, elementary, secondary, early childhood. And so some ways that I've found to make it student-centered and to provide student choice is thinking about how my students are allowed to submit work. So instead of just doing a traditional discussion board, I give students choices that we kind of rotate through. So I use um, Flip, which you see Flipgrid, and have students engage in video discussions within groups. Um, I have students write more informal blog posts or create sketch notes. I've uh, played around with having students create TikToks or Instagram Reels um, or using Loom to record their thoughts on the topic. Also, considering what students are allowed to submit, instead of providing the same prompt, I um, usually provide three to five that students can pick one or two to respond from. And this makes the discussions more um, differentiated and it's interesting to see what students choose uh, which prompts to respond to and it creates a more lively discussion and also providing flexibility of when they can submit work I try to give my weeks kind of spill over on top of each other so I'll give them till Friday to su submit their discussion their first you know post and then I allow the discussion to bleed over into week two and so we kind of have this rolling discussion where we're wrapping up last week and starting anew and it just um, seems to encourage students to engage more with each other. Also my assignment topics. I have students in my course from early childhood education to secondary equine, right? And so it's a large range and so letting my students choose their topics to cater to their subject matter expertise has been really powerful because they're invested in the topic and it's something that they know about and is going to benefit them in their future. I also try and encourage real world application within my assignments as much as possible. So when we're learning a new technology such as podcasting, I have students connect it to a topic they will hopefully be teaching in their future and allowing them to use all of the things they're creating in their future classroom. And then lastly, giving choice of if they're going to work individually or as a group. So again, back to my podcast assignment, the student could do that individually or they could work in a duo or trio to create a podcast on a t um, topic of their choice. And I have found just these simple changes make it more learner-centered and learner-driven and students really appreciate the autonomy they are given. So our final thoughts as we went through this learning circle and plan this presentation today, our goal is all about students becoming and developing their knowledge and changing and evolving maybe they were a flat earther when they came to your course right and now they've changed their perspective and they believe that the worth the earth is now round um, but we have to give those students those opportunities to pause their beliefs and consider the different perspectives and ideas that are out there and our goal is to create a community that as Dempsey says create students who express passionate and committed openness to otherness and are constantly able to pause their own beliefs, question their own beliefs, and then reinvent their learning as needed. And then this QR code will have a link to a Google Doc with more information and examples in our slides. And we'll open up for questions if we have time. Thank you. When there's something like flat earth, we can all do it. But what if the question there is like evolution or something that might really get at a heart of a religious belief? Yeah, I think that's a, a great question. And I think we can't expect our students to change their belief because there might be some core you know, religious beliefs that they aren't going to change. But having students consider the other perspectives within that. And maybe at the end, they look at all the other evidence and they still choose to maintain their belief. Or you expose them to all these different arguments and they say, hey, you know what? 
Maybe I do want to align myself more over here, but you give them the exposure and the opportunity, but we, we can't force our students to see something a different way if they don't want to. But we have to give them the opportunities to do so. Can I add something yeah. to that real Go fast? Um, what I liked in the book was that it talks about creating a space of non-gentlemen. We, sus we suspend our judgment we go into this space, we allow ideas to flow and to come, and we just hear what is to be said. We do not come up with a conclusion in that space. Then we leave that space, and then that's when we can decide if we're going to take something, if we're going to leave something, if, we're, if I'm going to allow something to percolate and, and maybe just ponder on it. And that's where ideas change. That's where the belief happens, is when a thought or a, a heard opinion can sit and percolate and we can ponder on it. It's not in this one session, this one topic, all of a sudden my whole belief changes. It's that allowing and creating that space of where we all come together suspended in this otherness and that's where beliefs can change. And Dempsey talks about how this takes time. So these conversations are going to be happening multiple times throughout the semester. You can't have like one session and have it be a transformative learning experience. Like it's something that's going to slowly evolve over time. And students may hold on to that belief for, you know, even years after your course before they change. So it's, um, yeah, I think it's a process and it's a new way of thinking for many students. Thank you so much, everyone.